Salutations to respected viewers. This is George from Ireland. I'm continuing my series uh, for A-level history um, about Weimar Germany and the Third Reich. Uh, so picking up where I left off, um, it was November 1932 when the Nazis scored 33% of their votes in the Reichstag election. So their share of the vote had gone down a little bit. They peaked that July. Anyway, it was impossible to form a government without bringing in either the Nazis or the communists into coalition. Well, the communists were anathema to everybody else, um, including the socialists. There'd been a split between the moderate and the extreme left right after the First World War. The SPD, the socialists, they were one of the major Weimar, Weimar parties, and they were at daggers drawn with the communists. Remember, the communists had attempted a revolution in January 1919, and a couple of times after that. So um, they absolutely hated each other, despite being not so far apart ideologically. Um, Anyway, for the, the, the conservative elite parties, let's say the DNVP, the DVP, um, they uh, thought the Nazis were ones they'd like to bring into coalition. They'd already cooperated with them on the Hartsburg front a couple of years earlier. The draft law against the Young Plan, remember the Young Plan of 1929, was the United States extending credit to Germany for a further five years. And uh, the Hartsburg front of the Nazis, the DNVP, the DVP, said this was the economic enslavement of the German people, and anyone who voted for the Young Plan must be judged a traitor. They didn't get their way. But the Nazis had got used to cooperating with the conservative elite parties. Um, they'd also, uh, Nazis had um, the assistance of Alfred Hugenberg, who was a prominent conservative elite politician, media mogul, because he owned newspapers, cinemas, radio stations, and so forth, and had given them access to his media empire. Uh, so the offer was made to Hitler, would he be willing to be chancellor, there was some horse trading about how many cabinet ministers he would get. He was going to get two Nazis in the cabinet along with him, and the others would be ministers from uh, uh, other political parties, DNVP, DVP, and the, the Centre Party. Um, now, the president, Paul von Hindenburg, was in, in his mid-80s and was increasingly senile. His son, Oskar von Hindenburg, was a good friend of um, Franz von Papen. Von Papen had been chancellor, was a Centre Party politician, been in the same cavalry regiment as Oscar von Hindenburg. As the uh, president was increasingly losing his mind, he was ever more reliant on his son. So there was a camarilla, as they called it, as in a group of courtiers, for lack of a better word, we now I suppose we now call them aides, around the president who had to control him, make him presentable for meetings, brief him, because he was very forgetful, cantankerous, liable to fall asleep in meetings and so on. Uh, so he obviously trusted his son who persuaded him that making Hitler chance was the right thing to do. Uh, von Hindenburg, in his lucid moments, felt nothing but disdain for the Nazis. And when it was suggested to him years before that, uh, that Hitler might be in government, he'd said, that Bavarian corporal, I wouldn't put him in charge of a post office. Now, Hitler was from Austria, not Bavaria. But um, uh, von Hindenburg, being a Prussian, might consider the Austrians and Bavarians to be much the same people. Another point, Hitler served in the German, not the Austrian army, and he'd served in a Bavarian regiment. So th there was a bit of um, regional tension there between people from different uh, areas of Germany. So um, uh, von Hindenburg was a Colonel Buffed and Tufton type. He was a, a Prussian aristocrat, decorated war hero, very old school. But he considered that, um, Hitler to be a yob, like a football hooligan or something. But his mind was failing. Anyway, 30th of January 1933, the Nazis accomplished their goal. They had they'd taken the legal route to office. They had cheated in elections a bit. They'd beaten people up, and yes, they'd killed some people. But overall, they'd got there through electoral politics. Hitler said we'd have to hold our nose and take our seats beside the um, uh, Catholic and communist deputies. The Catholic deputies, he meant the centre party politicians. So um, Hitler was chancellor, and Franz von Papen was vice chancellor. Von Papen said at the time, we've hired him for our act. So, like a lot of conservative elitists, they believed that Hitler was dim and could be easily manipulated, but in fact, they underestimated him and he was going to, able, he was going to outmaneuver them. They thought uh, he was quite, he was quite uh, stupid, he was lower middle class, there was some snobbery involved in all this as well. So the SA held a victory parade in the heart of Berlin that evening. Hitler and President von Hindenburg reviewed them from a balcony. Uh, new elections to the Reichstag were scheduled for March. Um, so that was that. 
And it was an astonishing turn of events that um, the uh, communists and the Nazis between them had over 50% of the vote. Most people were voting for parties that were openly anti-democratic. Um, so the fear of communism is something it's uh, difficult to understand now. Uh, that was a very profound uh, fear in the minds of many people. Uh, the communist revolution taking place in Russia, the Russian Civil War, and lots of Russian refugees had fled to Germany, particularly Berlin. They tend to be from the property classes and uh, religious people, and so they tell lurid lur tales of how um, monstrous communism was. So uh, not all Germans were anti-Russian racists. Some of them listened sympathetically and thought, well, that must be terrible. We mustn't have that here. And the Communist Party in Germany was attracting at least 10% of the vote, and they had um, a very clear solution to the Great Depression. They said, this is capitalism, got to get rid of it. Um, they, so there was this threat of communist revolution looming, and the communists said, we must create the Soviet Republic of Germany. The Soviet Union is the model to emulate, and Stalin is a fantastic man. Um, so the communists had considerable support uh, amongst the working class, uh, particularly in the large cities like Berlin, Hamburg, Frankfurt, and so forth. Uh, it appeared to be the Nazis were the only viable alternative, and uh, the army officer corps considered the Nazis to be uh, reasonable, at least for the time being. Um, anyway, Hitler was the only hope of a durable government. Remember, chances had only lasted on average a year under the Weimar Republic. Why should Hitler be any different? So he would serve his purpose, tie the country over, through the worst of the Great Depression, and when he'd um, served uh, his um, conservative elitist masters, he would be thrown on the scrap heap. Um, anyway, just a few days after um, Hitler assumed the chancellorship, he had a meeting for the military top brass, in which he assured them of his profound respect for the officer corps and all their traditions. Uh, he promised that their objectives were his objectives, rearmament, uh, to annul the Treaty of Versailles, and to regain territory in the East, so forth, cut out the cancer of democracy, as he said. Um, an army officer later wrote down a minute of what, what had been said. Um, the National Socialist government ceased referring to Germany as a republic and instead called a Reich. The Second Reich he did in 1918. The Third Reich meant the Holy Roman Empire, dissolved in 1806. So um, this was to be the Third Reich. So Germany from 1933 to 1945 was sometimes called the Third Reich. At the time, they might have just said German Reich. Anyway, it was the Reich which Hitler later vowed would last for a thousand years, well, it lasted for 12. So let's look at the Nazi consolidation from power. They were certainly not secure in office. Um, there was an election coming up. Um, so there's little reason to believe that they were going to transform society. Um, the establishment would uh, exploit them for its own purposes and discard them when the moment was ripe. But then a gift came for the Nazis. In February 1933, um, the SA, in, in the province of Bavaria, which was the largest one, they got to be Hilfpolizei, help police. Just an SA man in his brown shirt uniform would wear a help police um, armband and had the power of arrest. And if you're a communist who'd been um, severely beaten up by some Nazis and you ran to the police for protection, you might well find the police station. The so-called police officer is simply an SA man with a help police armband. Anyway, a couple of SA men were in a pub and they overheard a deranged Dutch communist named Marinus van der Lube bragging that he was going to set fire to a major public building. Hadn't yet picked which one. Um, a couple of nights, nights, nights later, the Reichstag, that's the parliament building, burnt down. Now, I've been inside it. It is a gigantic building. There was no way the fire could have broken out in several different places at once, so van der Lube had help. There seems to have been a tunnel through which he was brought there by the SA. They set him up to it, and he was arrested at the scene, unharmed. Um, years later, SAA men acknowledged that yes, they did uh, set the fire with him. Um, it seems that Hitler was genuinely surprised. It may have been an initiative of some of his lieutenants, uh, particularly Goering, because the tunnel was from his office to there. Goering was, was Hitler's number two, um, uh, former Air Force pilot from the First World War. Uh, married to a very wealthy Swedish woman, which was a boon to the Nazi party. Anyway, the Reichstag then met in the Kroll Opera House um, down the street. They were told that the fire was an attempt on the state, and uh, this uh, act of arson was monstrous. The Lex Luber was passed, Lex being like the Latin word for law. It retroactively uh, introduced the death penalty for arson. So the pyromaniac Fonda Luber was executed 
a year later by a, gu by a guillotine, and the man operating it was wearing a dinner jacket at the time, curiously. Um, long after the dissolution of the Third Reich, an investigation uh, exonerated Fondo Luba on the grounds that he was mentally ill, a McNaughton judgment, guilty but insane, and he'd been put up to it by the Nazis. All right, then the Reichstag passed a law for the protection of the German Reich in home, but I should talk about that in the next video.